West West Show. Yoda, salut falava, and welcome to the Counter Ruck, a podcast where we discuss all things rugby. I'm the host of the Counter Ruck, Stacey, so thanks for joining us for another episode. We're joined today by um, a lot of our regular panel, so I'll start by introducing everyone. We've got firstly from the city of the future and uh, one of our senior Wiz Wiz columnists, uh, Mr. Joey Nanai. Joey, mate, thanks for jumping on us. Thank you for having me once again. No worries, brother. We also have a uh, French rugby supporter, part-time Fiji supporter, looking at his jersey, um, Ian <laughs> Foster's uh, number one fan. Roger, Roger, brother, thanks for jumping on us. What? You could be on that new show um, with Oscar Kitely with that. Uh, It'll kill you. Thing. No, no, no. <laughs> nice brothers. All right, boys, before we get into it, I'll take care of some housekeeping. So um, for our listeners or our viewers, check out our website, uh, www.wizwiznet.com, and don't forget to click the Support Us button on the page to keep the content flowing, and we also have some exclusive content available for our supporters, so definitely some additional benefits there. I'll also mention you can follow the Counter Ruck on Twitter and Facebook, so give us a follow and give us a like. Okay, boys, so the uh, the World Cup's in full swing now, and we saw a real uh, clash of the titans to open the tournament between two teams that will have high hopes of going quite far, with the All Blacks playing France. So I wanted to start uh, with that opening game, mate. So, Joey, mate, I'll get your uh, thoughts first. Uh, what did you make of that opening clash? I thought it was, uh, it was a great game um, between the French and the All Blacks. Uh, unfortunately, the result didn't go the way of the All Blacks, which is what we wanted. Um, I thought the French played very well and it was a well-deserved win on their part. Um, it was officiated by a uh, well-renowned referee, Mr. Yako Piper, Piper, depending on which side of the world you're from. Um, <clears throat> for the All Blacks, uh, on a whole, played um, below their normal standards across the board, um, especially in the backs. I'm a bit biased in saying that because I'm a forward and, you know, forwards can hardly ever do badly in my eyes. Um, I just think the the backs, two in particular, uh, probably didn't shine as much as they could have or normally do. Um, and, you know, uh, I think there were moments in the game that, you know, left some question marks. I think there were also um, parts of the game, like the scrum, that were absolutely mm. dominated by the French. Um, and I don't know whether that's a, a something that they will focus on this week, leading into the next game against Namibia. Or whether that's something that we just can't fix with the personnel that we have over there in France. So, um, you know, f good luck to the All Black Pack. Um, I'm a big fan, but at the same time, I think uh, we totally got dicked in the scrum and we need to do something about it. I mean, granted... The French are the, the top team at the moment. They're the inform national international side, I think, in my eyes, at the moment. And I think they are the front runners to, or the favourites to win the World Cup. Um, obviously, my heart's with you know the All Blacks and Monza more to win. Um, either of th those two winning the World Cup would make me happy. Um, but at the same time, it's like, as an All Blacks fan, you just you don't like to see your team, your All Blacks team, play to a mediocre level, which is yep. what I thought I saw. Yep, I agree with all that. And it's interesting you talk about the scrum because that's what I saw as well. The set piece was poor. Uh, Ethan De Groot, he conceded two scrum penalties, and those resorted, resulted in, you know, France kicked both of them. That's six points right there. And you know, rugby is a relatively simple game. If you can't get your set piece right, it's a lot, a pretty much an uphill battle against there from there from there on in. And France are too good to think that you know, we're going to win with a sub sub pass scrum. So 100% agree with all that. But Roger, mate, I'll get your thoughts 
what did you make of that game? And, and you just anything you think the All Blacks need to do to improve? I just did a quick tally of the of the caps in that forward pack um, for France. France had 233 caps just in their forward pack alone, and the majority and the most capped forward that started. This is just the starting eight was Winnie uh, Tornil, the tight head prop for France. So he he was he had played 53 tests prior to this particular match. So 233, he's the most capped forward. And then you've got uh, Gael Fiku, who had 80, 81 uh, prior to this match. So he's the most capped French uh, player that started, as well as the most capped back. So And they had 259 caps just in that. Uh, Backline alone, uh, Antoine Dupont playing his fiftieth match. There was a few guys playing their fiftieth, if um, if the stats are right. Uh, Moonga was playing his fiftieth. Mm. So was uh, Lolala Nepal Lolala. So yeah, it's quite a few. Unless they were playing their forty ninth, unless they've added what they played on the weekend now to their tallies. So. 233, 259, so they're just under the 500. But in the forward pack alone for the All Blacks, there was 522 caps. Okay. And that's mm-hmm. where Whitelock is, you know, he was 149, Scott Barrett 105. So the majority go there. But just, you know, I mean, you talk about the, the scrum penalties that even degree, and it was just the pressure. Like a lot of it, the two penalties that he gave away that were given away and it was attributed to him was because his knee was on the ground. So automatically now, I think the way it's changed is that if your knee is on the ground and he could he could still uh, recover from that, but once it touches the knee, it's, it's deemed a penalty. Uh, once it, your knee touches the ground, it's deemed a penalty straight away. So, mm. um, and every time the camera focused in on Ethan De Groot after being penalised, obviously he disagreed with what was happening, but. Again, it comes back to Winnie Atu O'Neill, who in 2019, in 2019, he was the heaviest. Oh, no, actually, Tomo Piao was the heaviest. But Winnie Atu O'Neill was deemed to be one of the, the the giants of the front row in international football. Height as well as his uh, his weight. Um, so... And so that wasn't going to that wasn't going to be an easy walk in the park for Ethan to group, and it just goes to show there with the added pressure. But I think when your knee goes to the ground, I don't know, Joey, you might add some information here. Is it's it's not only the pressure that's coming from the French pack, but it's the pressure coming from behind as well from your own forward. So if you haven't got your body profile um, correct or in the in a, in a comfortable position, so. But at the same time, you've got to learn to be uncomfortable. And these guys know that uh, well and true. But it just seemed, to, for some reason, a um, couple of scrums went down. There was another one where Nepolo Rala, he, his side was penalised as well. So we were struggling in the set piece. It wasn't like they were pushing us back uh, in, in a, you know, by any stretch of the imagination. But it was just that the pressure on who could maintain their, their shape. And I think that's where the French were able to get one over us. Did we miss Tyson? I mean, sorry, um, what's his Lomax, name? Lomax, Terrell Lomax. Lomax, Terrell, yeah. Did we miss him a bit? I guess, you know, he's mm. he's probably been starting the last few tests up until that injury uh, against South Africa. So I guess we will, it will be, you know, it remains to be seen. But then right across, you know, 522 tests just between the forward pack. And then you got Aaron Smith on 119. Rico Ioane and Anton Lena Brown, 63 apiece. Yeah. It's only Mark Telea that hasn't hit, you know, double digits in that whole Bowden Barrett at the back at 15, 115 tests. So you're looking at close to what, just off the top of my head, 900 caps in that All Blacks team that started. So we're, you know, despite like what Joey said, French were coming in with their, you know, as possible favourites, given that, you know, the way that their uh, test results have been going. And they demolished, uh, well, they didn't demolish it, but they had a good result against Fiji 
prior to Fiji beating the English as well last week. So they were coming in on a high. The All Blacks suffering that test loss to South Africa last week. They had a lot to sort of answer for, and, and this was the test, the opener. But home crowd advantage, opening match. Um, the French are hosting. It's their tournament to lose, really. And they put a result like that. I mean, we could go through the way that I saw it all play out. Um, again, we've t- touched on the group struggling, you know, to keep his knee off the ground. Uh, Bowden Barrett uh, was put under pressure when Valier kicked the ball. And then you had Dupont chasing the ball. And you saw Dupont's pace. And it put Barrett under pressure for him to dive desperately to take the ball into touch. Um, that was at about the 30th minute. Um, there was a, a little uh, sequence where I saw some good tackling from Fiku, who tackled Papali'i, and then Wardy, who's the, the starting lucid prop, he tackled Will Jordan at full stop. Will Jordan came full full bore, and, and Wardy could... And then you had Cross, Francois Cross, who, who tackled Bowden Barrett, all in that same sequence before Taylor passed it to the cameraman just before half-time. So you saw, saw the desperation, whether they had a low number on their back or someone in the backs. Everyone was was just doing what they could do to make sure this all-black juggernaut couldn't get, get through. Admittedly, they did start off really well on that first couple of minutes, and it was within two minutes we had scored, and it was one minute, 32 seconds to be exact when Mark Talia received that cross kick from from Bowden Barrett, so our intentions were good, and it was from the the short ball to Rico Ioane. Rico Ioane, you know, saw a gap. He got, he got tackled later uh, beyond the twenty two, but it was Bowden Barrett. Like I say, you know, we were had momentum, but in the wide shot, it showed Bowden Barrett already signalling to to Mark Talia. You know, this we're, we're coming for the cross kick, and then uh, Will Jordan had to play half back. Swings it back to, because Aaron Smith had taken a quick quick uh, tap from a penalty, and then he had taken a quick tap, was held up by a lot of the fours, but he was able to, he managed to get to the ground. Will Jordan passes it back to Moonga Moonga because of what Jordan Barrett, I mean, Bowden Barrett had really signaled to Talia, and that's where the cross kick came. Luckily, the bounce was kind. Old, old blues moves, doing that all the time with the blues. That old combination. I thought he hadn't he hadn't caught it on the full, and then you know, like we're seeing mm. with Talia, he's just been able to you know make something out of nothing, or just the ball sits up really nicely for him. And 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 we started off with a hiss and a roar, so we just thought that was a good sign, a good indicator as to what we were expecting of the All Blacks. They were coming to play, but then there was a an injury concern for the hooker. Uh, for French hooker, and a young man by the name of Beato Malvaca comes into play. And Beato Malvaca, I mentioned him in a former pa- uh, former pod, someone to work uh, to look out for. And he's he's already won a couple of titles with Toulouse, and I think this most current season, the recent season, he won another title. And he's only twenty six, but doesn't look like he's a big boy. But he's 124 kilos and he's mobile. He was involved in so much of the play. And there's a lot of times throughout that, that first of the, of the game that where he's he adds a lot of impetus because he reminds me of not only a Dane Coles, but he's a little bit of a Tokiaho as well. But within three minutes of the second half, Talia scored again, again, within in, in the French. Uh, Oh, hold on. But it was potentially a forward pass. And that's why the French players stopped. But they didn't play to the whistle. Mark Talia obviously carries on. And a try was scored in that third half. But I guess before that, um, what I wanted to make a point was, after make, after pointing out Fiku, Wardy and Cross tackled a lot of All Blacks, there was, there was a play leading up to, um, before that, we Will Jordan missed a tackle on Wardy on the prop. And then Anton Leonard Brown missed a tackle on Villar, the winger, despite them running running backwards. But I wasn't quite convinced on Va'ai at number six. I'm not too sure what you guys thought. But um, not long after that, it was Beato Movaka 
uh, backdoor pass to Valia, and then where there was almost a oh no sorry backdoor pass to Jalibe the first five, and then they did almost exactly what we did with Bowden Barrett to Mark Talia and the cross kick, but uh, Richie Monga um, desperation saving try, but that was only mem- temporarily because then a, a minute later. Uh, Jalibert went cross field and Valier scores a try anyway because Jalibert was going across the field sucked in Va'ai Papali and Telea and then Valier was free on the on the right for them to score and I think that's where it sort of went down and then from the yellow card from Will Jordan at the 57th minute was rather costly, but Ramos's boot um, was crucial, as we mentioned, with those two penalties from set piece. From ch- but yeah, and then in the very last few minutes, Malvaka again turnover when Bowden Barrett returned the ball on the seventy eighth minute, and and number twenty three, Charmaine scores a try, and Umala case. So it was. <laughs> That was just a real brief sort of summary as to what we saw, and I think we were talking off off um, off the record. And Cam mentioned how Maunga was kicking a lot more than usual in this particular game, and sometimes it was it was just to relieve a little bit of pressure. But um, but then at the same time, he was trying to be a little bit more confrontational and try and seize that gap as well. But we just couldn't. I don't know. A lot of people are going to put it down to, so are we going to still have that same argument of Fozzie doesn't have a plan? Well, I didn't see you know, one. Because, again, we bring it up every time we there's a loss. It's it's never the assistance, right? It's always Fozzie. When there's a win, we give accolades to the, the assistance. So where are we now? Do we do we have a game plan? Is there a game plan? Were we just out-muscled, outplayed? The French just kept on grinding, you know, were able to just keep us at bay and defend, but then at the same time, take the penalty kicks uh, mm. at, at the necessary times. Yeah, yeah. good good uh, thoughts there, Rog. Um, it's hard to know. Uh, the Wall Blacks, the, the last two tests in a row, they've just, seems like they've almost fallen off a cliff after the good work they've done at the start of the season. I'm not sure what's going on there. You know, you talked about the experience factor the All Blacks have got. Part of me just wonders if the All Blacks just got a bit too old. And then Whitelock, Retallick, Bodie, Aaron Smith, these Centurions, Coles, and these guys just ain't the players they once were. And it's probably too late to deviate from the plan and make wholesale changes. But, you know, I don't know if a reliance on their old guard might come back to bite them. But there's one thing I wanted to touch on, which Joey's also brought up as well, so the selections. Two over iron at six. So you brought that up, Rog, with its... Uh, not sure if that was a good idea, but Joy, I remember you mentioned that in our chat. He's never played there. And it sort of felt a little bit like um, when the All Blacks picked Scott Barrett at six in that semi final in 2009. You know, was that the right call? Um, well, probably not. But, uh, mate, Joy, mate, what did you make of the, that call? And, and what changes, if any, would you be looking to make uh, from the selection side, if any? Well, um, good questions. I, I just. Yeah, I felt like um, it was unfortunate that poor old Tupo, uh was selected in a in a position that he hasn't played in the All Black jersey in before, and you know, to me, it just to to have a little go at what Roger asked about Fozzy. No, he doesn't get the full blame, though. Traditionally and typically, when <laughs> teams lose, they look at the coach immediately, right? Mm. The coach mm. always gets the blame for any loss that a rugby team has. So that kind of partly answers that question about Fozzie. He will be looked at as, as the blame. He may not be the blame because he didn't actually go out there and play the game. But he did guide these players, right? And he is Granted, responsible for them. I understand that totally, Joey. Yeah. It's more from a fan base and spectatorship, you know, it's easy with everything that's said on social media is mm. that, you know, it's when we win, when the All Blacks win, it's the accolades are given to the to the assistants. When they lose, 
as they have been now. That's that's lost number ten or eleven in his tenure. So oh, more than that, yeah, surely it's it's, it's Fozzie's. No, nope, I think it's twelve max, but I think it's ten or eleven. We've just gone over ten. Okay, I believe I, I, we can get <laughs> we can get that fact check, Cam, if you listen. <laughs> now that sounds yeah, cool. I, yeah. I think he was sitting on nine for a bit, but then I think the loss in Twickenham took him to ten. I think this weekend was number eleven. Is that a is that a record loss for the All Blacks at a World Cup? Yep, against yes. against France. Against anyone. Well, it's mm. a, that's the biggest it's a first. loss they've ever had in a World Cup, margin wise. The first wow. loss in a pool, and first loss the week, pool that week before yep. um, was the biggest loss in All Black history against South Africa. So he's getting a lot of firsts mm. on the, the bad side there. Yep. Um, <laughs> but then at the same time, you know, when we we've lost. When we we lost the first ever semi final against the French as well back in ninety nine, we lost the first ever quarter final against the French in oh seven. So the French have been a bit of a bogey team for us, despite the fact that we've beaten them in two World Cup finals as well. Mm. So, um, well, well, just the, the record that, is now three wins to France. Three, they won three of the five games they have played in the World Cup. So the two World losses Cup. that you put. Put up, Roger, the 99 and 07, and in this one, those are our three losses. The two wins are the two that you brought up, the two World Cup finals. So they've got a good record mm. against us, and they're not scared of the All Blacks, like a, a lot of teams are at World Cup Absolutely, Cups yeah, that's right. Yeah, and I remember that 99 loss, because when, when we lost yeah, the 99, too. the French, were cel- they celebrated, and, and but at the same time, very respectful, because despite winning that match, they still, still were adamant that the All Blacks are still the best in the world. And then they went on to lose the final after that. They had played their final against the All Blacks. It was, mm-hmm. It's an interesting sort of aura that the All Blacks have. You beat them. It doesn't matter if you beat them. They still were deemed, well, by the French at the time, that the All Blacks, and even around the world by fans, if you beat the All Blacks, but they're still regarded as number one in the world. I don't know if that same aura is there with recent losses to Ireland and you know Argentina, but are they are they losing some of that aura with some of these recent losses, or is it just the world catching up and making it competitive, making it a good? Because you can't categorically say who the top three contenders are or top four for this World Cup. It's mm. it's spread out. It's it could be any team of the top eight. I reckon six top six top eight. Yeah, nice. Yeah, mate, Joey, mate, what did you make of the sel- any selection changes you make? And also that two of I at six, because you put that up in our chat that that was a bad call, and it was. There is one change that I would make. It's a, it's going to be a controversial one um, that uh, I don't know if my fellow Blues supporters will like, <laughs> and that's Bowden Barrett. Um, his performance and performances in recent games there's just something about him that seems like he's lost a bit of confidence and a bit of that, I don't know, that world, he's a world-class player, right? Let's not take that away from him. But he just seems to be out of form at the moment. And I would replace him with someone like Richie Maunga even at fullback. Ooh. But again, Damien McKenzie. <coughs> just, and and yeah. bring DMAC in. Let DMAC have a go at, uh, at 10. Or hit DMAC at the back. Another mm. person who who should be at the back, who's not at the back currently, is Will Jordan. Will Jordan plays better at fullback than he does at winger. So why do we keep picking him on the wing? Right? And and Jordan's another person who I wouldn't necessarily drop Will Jordan, but he got sent off you know, two aerial challenges in the game that against France that the first one was deemed to be reckless and the second one, you know, obviously he got the penalty was dangerous got the penalty and you know it's like come on man so um will jordan is a better fullback than winger will jordan should not be dropped but i think he definitely needs to be on the field somewhere and i would start him at fullback if not um start Bodie off the bench because world cup history shows he does fucking awesome off the bench right and maybe have richie maunga somewhere else 
unfortunately for Richie, the only other somewhere else is fullback for him. Um, if you're going to bring someone like D-Mac in sooner. Has he ever like, played I'm, fullback? I'm a massive fan of, um, oh, Richie. Richie, I, I don't know. It is a big call to have him at fullback, but I would have him at fullback if we're going to bring D-Mac in somewhere. Well, have D-Mac at fullback and leave Richie at 10. But mm. even Richie doesn't seem to perform well under pressure, it seems, in certain certain facets of the game. You know, there are times when the pressure's on and it just seems like Richie either goes missing or he just makes some some key decisions that don't go our way. That doesn't mean I have lost all faith in Richie. I think Richie is the guy that will steer us as a 10 to um, that World Cup glory if we are lucky enough to get it at this point. Um, but the one area in the All Blacks that I think definitely needs a uh, a review or overhaul even, is the loose forward mix. You know, the loose forward mix, time and time again, it's been called into question. You know, with a lot of fans saying, look, they need a big ball-playing number eight. And unfortunately for Artie, he's not a big ball-playing number eight. And I think his position is seven. But then where do you put Sam Kane when he's fit and not concussed and, and doesn't pull out last last minute? Right. Um, there's also um, there's also, also um, criticism about Sam Whitelock for his lack of go forward. You know, there's there's criticisms all across the board. But that's not to say that they couldn't uh, fix things and come up with some um, better drilling midweek and get all these right for for a test match. It's not to say they couldn't, but I think these key areas like you know. The set piece, obviously, that's going to come out of my mouth as a, as a former front row. The set piece is where they need to really, that's the basics, right? You get yeah. the set piece right, you can have that platform for your halfback to then distribute the ball nicely to the backs and they don't have to worry about any, you know, moving backwards or getting deeper just because, you know, they're getting pushed back off their own ball. Um, and again, Ian Foster does get the blame for, for losses or does get looked at as a person responsible for losses, but it, it is. It's a collective L, if you like. Everyone needs to take that L on the chin. Everyone. Not just the playing 15. Everyone. The whole squad, the supporting staff, everyone needs to take that L on the chin. Everyone needs to, you know, regroup, regather, and get back to winning ways by winning every, you know, one percenter that's out there. Um, there is some importance in beating Italy. Moving on from that, um, I think, you know, Italy in the past um, have shown that, you know, they're getting closer and closer to that day where they, you know, get to beat the All Blacks again. So... <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll definitely so it's like, look at um, it's like, okay. you know, um, the, the, the All Blacks have a lot of work to do. They've got a lot of um, soul-searching, if you like. I mean, it is it is only the first game, and we kind of expected, or some of us expected France to beat them in the first game. And, you know, it'll be telling us uh, whether or not the All Blacks will uh, go on to the final and possibly win it. I'm not so sure. Uh, uh, I'm sure you guys remember that before the World Cup even started, I went for another team, and I'll stick to that just quietly. But um, until they, you know, start showing some wins or losses, then you know I'll, I'll humbly fall on my sword. But um, you know, and fair fair play to the Wallabies. You know, they're taking a huge risk in their in their aspect in their side of the World Cup. They're taking a huge risk by. Firstly, they took a whole young squad, and Eddie Jones is making some big, massive monster claims, and f good luck to them. But at the same time, the All Blacks need to take care of business over here and get back to winning ways in every aspect of their preparation, every aspect of their game. Um, and I think bringing over, and I'm sure we'll cover this, Ethan Blackadder is going to be a huge lift to the team. 
even though, you know, the rest of us fans were kind of looking at, oh, yes, does Sean Stevenson get a look at or get a look in or is he going to bring uh, someone else in the mix? You know, obviously Brad Webber's already over there. And who was the other fella, Rog, that you said? Fino. 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 Some Fino's Fino. Fino. Yeah. So he's already there. So, look, I think uh, good luck to the All Blacks. All the best to them. At the same time, it's it's up to them to make the most of what they've got and the opportunities that are in front of them because it's not going to be an easy feat for them to win this World Cup. Um, and if they do, man, I take back every bad thing I've ever said about Ian Foster. <laughs> you don't have to, Joey. You don't have to. <laughs> no, good thoughts. Well, that's just a um, challenge. That's just a challenge, eh? Yeah, uh, good thoughts, brother. Um, I, the selections, that's, that's where it gets a bit interesting, eh? Because that's back-to-back losses. And, you know, Foster stayed relatively faithful to the guys that he, he's been picking. So it might get a bit interesting. The Will Jordan to fullback is one that I wanted initially, but now I'm not so sure, eh? He was a bit shaky under the high ball. And for all the greatness, he's got that attacking thrust and brings so much on the counterattack. It's that aerial pressure that I'm not sure he can cope with. That's, uh, I saw him against South Africa last year where they just put bomb after bomb up and he just he couldn't take those high balls. And that happened again on the weekend. So, you know, as a fullback, that's sort of their bread and butter. And that's my only issue with Will Jordan probably playing fullback. Um, I think that teams will target him with the kicking game and we think those Northern Hemisphere teams kick a lot. And 100% agree about the loose forwards. I don't know what they're going to do. But you think if Sam Kane didn't get injured, right? They were going to have Popoli'i, Kane and Savia. That was going to be their starting loose forward mix. That's three sevens all playing together. And I'm not sure that that's the way forward. You know, you got to probably... You need a ball running eight, like you said, um, and all these other things. So... You know, picking three sevens, the yeah, I, I thought that was a mistake straight away. But uh, you got thoughts there, mate. Um, Roger, do you have any thoughts on the selections before we move on to the next next topic? Anything? That I would comes have thought. To okay, so now Sam Kane's out. Well, with that game, I would have thought they would have moved Adi to seven, Papali'i to seven, six, and then Jacobson come in at eight, or you could leave Adi at eight. Jacobson at six and Papali'i to seven. Mm. So because these three can play multiple positions, that's the luxury we have. But then it's also, like you say, having three sevens play the, the loose trio. When you look back at the sixes that we've had in the past, Jerome Kaino, Jerry Collins, you know, and it's, it just have we, we – and they, they played like – Jerry Collins played 47 tests for the All Blacks. And and uh, Kaino, I think eighty eighty plus, Ooh. and so they they were incumbents for you know a good number of years. Have we had any of that in the last few years? Unfortunately, it's been a bit of a mis, you know mixed bag. Moving Adi to cater for Sam Kane's attributes as well at seven, and and I, you know. Have we now become unstuck now? Because for them to go first put a call to put two ball for A and at six, I, I found that quite interesting. Because now that you've got the likes of Ethan Blackadder on the way, he's the answer there at six. I believe he he jumps over to Paul. To Paul then misses out of a spot because then where do we have you know who starts? Because then you got Scott Barrett, who can be a lock that can play six. He's not a six that plays lock. Because he had the six at all. In. From what I saw, that 2019 World Cup. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, but, it was scary. <clears throat> admittedly, <laughs> the way that Scott Barrett played on on the weekend, he was he was rangy like a six, mm. but he was just he had so many carries, good ball carries, and he made some good meters as a lock, a, a ball running lock. And then you mentioned the Sam Whitelock factor, Joey and, and Stace, and then when it came to Sam. It almost seemed like things went into slow motion every time. Oh, but then, you know, but it's it's the experience. You know, obviously there's the experience factor with Sam Willock and what he uh, provides in terms of leadership across the park, his um, expertise in the, in the set piece. So, again, it's that balance of you got a guy who's 
almost 150, 150 in, in test matches. You've got to keep them on. Stacey, you know full well how long Wales persisted with Alan Wynne Jones. So it's the same sort of experience that we have in, in a Sam Whitelock. Hmm. And then you've got Scott Barrett. The two centurions, they've got to be there. And then Brody Retallick. Where does Ethan Blackadder fit, fit into that mould with number six? We talked about fullback, D-Mac, possible option of having Richard Monger go there if Bowden Barrett's not. But then when you talk about Bowden Barrett's form, uh, we know what he has done in the past. We know what he could potentially provide. As he passed his best, I believe it's really sad, but yes, it is. You know, this, when he injected himself into a game off the bench, like you mentioned, Joey, he was a lot younger. You know, the, similar to when Israel Dag started, the impact that they provided off the bench when everyone else was fatigued and tired. You know, it just, it was just, it was, it was noticeable. It was massive. And, and maybe that's where Bowden Barrett provide, um, the best contribution to the All Blacks. Um, and, and I and I don't say that lightly because we know what he's done for the black jersey in the past, and it's and, and he's always provided, you know, come up trumps. Are we being found out? Sure, just it's, it's the improvement of other na international team. That's a part. Will Italy ever beat the All Blacks? Yes, but not this not this World Cup. It won't happen this World Cup. Mm -hmm. Seeing the way that they played against Namibia, yeah, they put fifty odd points on them. Um, I think it was 50, um, but I, I believe we're pretty safe against Italy. But they're gonna, they, they'll, they'll still give a good fist of it. It's gonna happen. We, we always, we talked about when Ireland couldn't beat the All Blacks. You know, it's been a good, how long? 70 years since the Welsh have ever beat the All Blacks. The last time was in 53. Will Scotland ever beat the All Blacks? It could come, but the way they performed against South Africa, I don't think so. So, yeah, uh, not nice there, Rog. Um, yeah, discipline an issue again. So, the, just the recap 12 4 penalty count against the All Blacks. And France didn't concede a pen any penalties in that second half. So, there was a period where the All Blacks were leading 13 9, and that ended up becoming 27 13 loss on the back of those penalties. So discipline again. But Rog, you've touched on something there, which we'll carry on, thought of. Um, you know, Fozzie's become the first All Black coach to lose a pool match in All Black history. They've got that crucial match against Italy just to confirm themselves in the knockout stages. I think that's going to be the, the, the one that can potentially slip them up. They should be able to beat the rest of the teams. But uh, Rog, you're not giving them mm -hmm. much of a chance. If they're ever going to lose, All Blacks, it'll probably happen under Fozzie's watch. So, mate, Joe, are you giving them any chance? Are you giving Italy any chance in that, that uh, crucial group stage? You know what's funny? I am actually. I'm giving them. Um, I am giving them a chance because they've looked all right. You know, to they've looked all right. And are you talking about that they look attractive? Are you, you, you quite like the Italian men? Oh, is, that, <laughs> is that how you took that? Oh, it's ambiguous is the way you said that. Is that how you took that comment? <laughs> it's how I interpreted it. <laughs> Is that what you thought of straight away? Um, so, <clears throat> so they like you know. I think Italy are looking like they've had their best chance to beat the All Blacks in a long time, especially because of the you know the poor performance that the All Blacks have had, or well, performances that the All Blacks have had in recent years. Not just not the the, the last couple of games, but in recent years. You know, they've been inconsistent to the All Blacks brand of footy that we know. And whether that's down to uh, coaching <laughs> by Ian Foster or not, that's that's up for, you know, that's anyone's perception. But uh, I, I just think Italy have a good chance to do the unthinkable. And what better place to do it than at a World Cup like everyone else does, you know? You know, more of a shining light gets gets uh, shone upon those types of results. You know, when an upset like that happens at a World Cup, everyone remembers. <laughs> That's right. So don't be that team. You know, the All Blacks, you know, I'm sure they have what a lot of teams have, which is 
not on my watch kind of attitude, right? So mm. they don't want to be the that All Blacks team that loses to Italy at a World Cup. It hasn't been done yet. And don't be the first ones, A. Ian Foster's All Blacks. Don't be the first ones. Okay, so they've played 15 times, 15 times in history. And Italy have never won any of those. And I, and I, <laughs> in Italy, they've played eight times. In New Zealand, they've played three times. There's the average score of 51 points as the margin, average margin of points. So I don't see it happening anytime soon. You know, eventually, They've bolstered their team. They've had a couple of uh, foreign inj injections uh, over the years with guys that qualify through residency after three years playing in Italy. Um, they've got a couple of Polynesians in Montana, Ioane, who plays for the Rebels, as well as Hame Fava, who scored a couple of tries against. And Hame Fava, he was, I think he played in Australia as well as, but then he was with the Hurricanes too this year. So he scored a couple of tries for them against Namibia. So, but then, and saying that, still they've never made it out of the pool. Pool play, they've been at every World Cup, but just I don't think they'll be getting out of this one either. They'll have a good result against Namibia. They've got Uruguay as well, but um, I just can't see them upsetting the All Blacks, despite the All Blacks mixed bag of results of late. Um, New Zealand should come in comfortably. Uh, it's, uh, but then at the same time, if France and New Zealand take Italy too lightly, and you know, and so that's why there, there could be the result there or a close encounter. But the thing is now, the added pressure where New Zealand have never been in this predicament where they've always topped their pool. So now they have to try and make sure that they get out of the pool play. So. Namibia, Uruguay, surely they'll they'll take care of them comfortably. Italy's the most danger dangerous game from here on in. It was always going to be France and Italy. They're the most stiff competition. Um, I think they should um, be able to get out of this pool. But now it just changes where they go from quarterfinals to semifinals. In two thousand and seven, when they dropped the when they lost in the quarterfinals, they had teams like Portugal to play. They tough. They had one tough game. And then there was, oh no, it was a real easy pull for them. And then come quarterfinals was their most, was their hardest game against the French. And then they lost it and then they were out. So that was the earliest that they've ever been, um, they, they ever sort of exited a World Cup. Will it happen again? Depending on where they finish now, because potentially they could be playing South Africa or Ireland if that's the, the top two from Pool B. So, there was always going to be that crossover in playing either of those two, whether they finish first or second in, this, in their pool now. So it just makes for interesting results going deeper into the competition. I agree with you saw that, Roger. But we have seen sort of a blueprint on how to beat the All Blacks and back-to-back -back tests against All Blacks. So South Africa, that, that warm-up match just before the World Cup and this opening match. So, you know, if you get kick long, put the All Blacks back, uh, win the set piece, which is a crucial part of it, put the pressure on them, and take advantage of the All Blacks' ill-discipline. So that's two back-to-back -back tests where their ill-disciplines cost them. And, you know, we've seen some of these refs are quite happy with the cards, and I think that could be a crucial thing. So I, I think that the All Blacks, that was the, when the All Blacks played South Africa at that time, that was a, a world rep, that was the All Blacks' biggest ever loss but that needs to be put in the perspective of the fact that, you know, they had two yellow, or three yellow cards and, and that red card as well. So mm. that ill discipline cost them. They basically paid a huge chunks of that game with 14 guys, and then South Africa would have put, put them away. Again, a yellow card to Will Jordan in this opening game. It's like I mentioned before, it's 13 9, All Blacks are leading. That penalty count against them, the yellow card, they lose 27 13. So their own ill discipline is what's costing them just as much as anything else. And if they get penalised in cards early on, I don't even want to think that's going to, that's possible because I'm with you. I think that the All Blacks, they, they should put them away. The only thing that could put a spanner in that works is if they cop an early yellows and early reds. So 
it's going to be interesting. Uh, not something we want as an All Black as All Blacks fans to say. Hopefully the All Blacks get out of their pool comfortably, which isn't something we've ever said before. Um, good thoughts there. I also want to look at something that we've talked about briefly. We might as well look at it a bit in deeper uh, detail. So Emuni Narawa ruled out. Um, I feel sorry for the guy. That's his, that's his uh, lifelong dream to represent the All Blacks at the World Cup. Um, he's gone, and they've called in uh, Ethan Blackheader. So, Joey, mate, I'll give you the first word, mate. Do you, do you like that call? And do you think that's the right um, the right guy to call in? Uh, Ethan Blackheader? Yeah, Ethan Blackheader for Narawa. Is that who you would have called in? Yeah, so um, the reason why that makes sense is because you've got injuries to, obviously, the captain, Sam Kane and Frizzell. And Frizzell was that you know blockbusting six that we were looking for. To to answer you know answer that question of who's going to be the sixth for this tournament and we were all obviously looking at him. Unfortunately for Akira Iwani, he hasn't been thrown into the mix because of whatever reason. But he would have been my other pick based on past performances. Um, I think his work rate has come into question in terms of does he hit enough rucks and that kind of thing. So that's on him to work on in the background and get himself back in the all-black jersey one day. Um, I think Ethan Blackadder coming into the mix, it definitely makes sense from a loose forward mix point of view. Um, I think they've got enough there to take care of you know the, the back, th- back three in terms of cover. Mm. Uh, you've also got, um, I think, Webber's over there. Is that right, Rog? Yeah. You got the speed of little Nuggety Weber, who is a halfback, but obviously he has the speed of a winger. Um, and I'm not sure if Fozzie will take that kind of a risk, but you know, if you want out and out speed, you've got him. Uh, yeah, I think for me, just it makes sense because he's a he's experienced. He brings in a different energy. He's a fan favorite. Um, not that that is is relevant, but uh, I think Ethan Black out of Brings a different level of energy to to the team. Sure, he's not a winger, but and you know, and you would expect a winger to be replacing a winger. But I, I'm thinking maybe Ian Foster is thinking about what he's already got over there, and thinking about where can Ethan or someone like Ethan really add to this to the squad. And I think energy wise, I think. Um, the fact that he will be the one coming in, I think that'll that'll lift the morale in in terms of the existing players. They've just come off a loss, and to hear that someone like Ethan's on a plane on the way over, that must be exciting for a lot of the the, the team to know. So that's that's why I think it makes sense. Yeah, Rog, you, what are your thoughts, mate? Narawa out. Who would you have picked uh, to to come into the squad? I think, I think it's not so much who I would have picked, but it, like Joey, I think it makes sense because, and then also with not calling on Akira Yuane, I've got some Ipini Finau who's already in England, but it seems like they've already they were they were banking on Ethan Blackadder to come right, and then he will be fast tracked in because of, we know what he's done with the time the short time that he's had in the All Blacks jersey. We've seen what he's done at um, at Super Rugby level. So it, it makes sense. He's and it was really unfortunate. He would have been in the All Blacks uh, World Cup plans anyway, uh, prior to his injury that he suffered. So really happy for him and his family. You know that he gets to play at a World Cup now or is part of the World Cup squad. But it'll be interesting to see how they juggle it. You know, with Frizzell, Sam Kane, because. It wasn't. I think some people may have thought that they're going to bring in a back, given that Narawa is, is is a is a winger. But I think they've got enough cover with the likes of Caleb Clark, um, D Mac, Geordie Barrett, in and around the the squad. So and then you know Sean Stevenson probably would have been something you know someone that's pretty close to probably getting an inclusion at the World Cup but we'll see how we fare uh, deeper into the into this pool play as well as the the latter parts of the the tournament 
but I think that'll strengthen um, our loose trio, and he might be able to add a little bit of impetus at playing six, as what we've seen him do in the past. But it just means where does Jacobson, you know, feature in all of this? Because he's he's pretty much our, our loose flanker on the bench now with with him coming in. Some, it's going to be some interesting changes around the reserves uh, come game day. But I think now that they've got past the French game, especially going past once we deal with Italy, but then you've got games like Uruguay and Namibia where they can, you know, still show respect for the opposition, but at the same time experiment with who who our best combinations are going deeper into the tournament. And that's where I'd like to see Ethan Blackadder either get a start at either at, at six um, before we get into even consider what a quarterfinal is going to look like. I just thought there, Raj. Um, that's a good point you make about um, Luke Jacobson. Because, you know, once um, Sam Kane got ruled out, they moved properly to seven, that's the right call. But Jacobson, I'm with you. He should have got that start at six. He's actually played a lot of six before. So mm. if he's not getting the start in that game, and then they're bringing Blackheader in, where does that put him in the in the ranks? So yeah. that's going to get but a then bit it could be like, here. you know, how they brought Rico Gear uh, late in the uh, 2000, oh, what, 2011 World Cup, but he didn't really feature. So he could still get brought in, but then will is Black at it just a just in case Jacobson or another loose four goes down. So he could either be just reserved to the reserves or does he get fast track just because of the special qualities that we know that he has. Mm. And it's funny because Olivier Magne, the French store that was a part of the ninety nineteen that that famously beat the All Blacks in the semi final in ninety nine. But then he was also part of the 03 World Cup campaign for the French. But that time they lost to the to the All Blacks in the third, fourth playoff. But he's he's come out before the World Cup started and saying that this is the weakest All Blacks um, in history. So, you know, has he got something to, uh, you know, has he got a case there? Similarly to what, I guess, what people have been saying, you know, in during this tenure of Foster's, you know, that maybe combinations haven't been right. Um, and maybe it is uh, the weakest, or given that they've lost um, so many teams, uh, so many games yep. within uh, this tenure. Yeah. Good, good thoughts there. Um, yeah, I, I quite like, well, I sort of like the call. I thought they were a loose or a lock short. So I'm, I'm happy they called a forward in. But to me, you know, Summer Benny Finau is already there. What was the point of his inclusion against Australia for that one test? Because he played quite good in that test. It's just, just to keep him away from the Ikalitahi. It's just to keep him away from the Ikalitahi. I mean, why are you calling someone from New Zealand to fly all the way over there when you can say, oh, you're in a, you're in a couple of rooms down in the hotel just why, coming to the training? And that's why I say he was already earmarked. I think they were banking on him recovering, getting some some uh, NPC matches under his belt and then we'll fast track you through. So uh, Sami Benny Finau is, you know, behind the likes of an Ethan Blackadder. Unfortunately, just just due to his, you know, his experience that he's already had with Super and some of the games that he's already had with the All Blacks in the last couple of years. And so... Unfortunate for his son Benny, you'd think that he could have been next cab off the rink. I, I would have thought he's already yeah. there. You don't have to fly someone over from New Zealand for you know twelve hours, fifteen hour flight, and then get over the jet lag when you can just say, "Hey, look, Sammy Benny, you're already here. You come in." Well, they could surprise us, Stace. They could say, "Yep, Ethan, you go to London, and Sammy Benny comes in to camp." I don't know. Okay. But it doesn't seem like it, the way that the media is <laughs> portraying it. it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right, good thoughts there. Comprehensive look at that first game. Um, not sure if there's much you just want to touch on from the other games, but one thing I wanted to look at, mate, Joy, I'll get you to have a, a look at this. Some of these refereeing calls. So that Fijian, they played Wales uh, today. Um, 
and I just caught the highlights, but it looks like they got started against the Welsh. And, you know, Stephen Jones is a UK rugby writer, and he's basically the number one fan of Northern Hemisphere rugby. He even wrote a column where he said that England, they got all the 50-50 calls go their way, and even some of the calls that were 90-10 in favour of Argentina, they went England's way. So it feels like the the top tier nations, the you know the teams that have all the all the power and everything, they're getting the favourable calls as well, and that's really impacted, particularly that game against Fiji. So I'm just curious, mate, what, what's your thoughts on that, and you know what impact you think that refereeing will have um, on the tournament? Oh, mate, um, it was quite unfortunate to see the disparity in which the officiating was done when comparing two key areas or key moments in the game where, um, you know, defence was hard up on their line, Fiji's attacking, and, you know, infringement after infringement is happening right in front of the ref's eyes, who seems to be standing a metre or two away from the ruck, and things are happening right in front of him that, you know, are clear for... The TMO to see, they're clear for us who are watching, you know, from a, the comfort of our own home to see on camera. And, you know, things are at, in what I call rush hour at that point, where so many things are happening at the same time. But all the ref needs to do is focus on that one or two players that are, you know, at risk of um, causing uh, or, you know, getting a penalty. And it looked like he should have given penalty on a few occasions there. And he did. He did give penalties to um, awarded penalties to Fiji that um, you know were infringements. Now, I think there were four in, in one part of the game towards the end of the game where you know it was hot on well the Welsh five meters or you know close to their line and it just seemed like the same uh, leniency wasn't afforded to Fiji when the Welsh were hard on their line trying to score a try against the Fijians when, you know, the yellow card was given to the Fijian player for his infringement. You know, the disparity is quite um, obvious as someone who watches the game, as, you know, anyone who watched the game could see and would probably question, and, you know, some former players, of international players from other countries have come out and, you know, asked questions about it and been like, what's going on here? You know, four penalties for the same thing and just a warning versus one penalty for the same thing and a yellow card comes out of it. What's, where's, where's the love, you know? <laughs> so my, my, I guess, view on the officiating is, Please, referees, don't let this be about you guys and your performance. Let it be about the performance of the players and the teams and these nations who have gone through so much just to get to this World Cup. And that goes for Wales and Fiji, not just not just Fiji. You know, um, all these players don't play to to get a result in their favour because of a biased referee. I'm not saying that this... This um, referee was biased. This English referee was biased, or wherever he's from. Uh, it did come out after the game through social media that this, I don't know whether it's true, that this particular ref was born in Wales. I don't know if that makes a difference. I don't know if that clouded his judgment or if that, you know, added some bias to some of his decisions, but I'll leave that up to you guys and I'll leave that up to our, our viewers. <laughs> but. You know, for me, it's like, don't let this be the narrative, please, referees. Come on, we can do better. Um, let's let's make this as fair as possible. I'm not saying that it wasn't fair, but it just doesn't look good when the disparity around similar situations is obvious for everyone to see. Um, you know, hard luck to Fiji. The opportunities were there to take the game. Obviously, they weren't taken, and... If you're going to leave it to the last play of the game where Simi Rodradra, poor guy, you know, he, he dropped the ball and there was no fault of his own. It was a slippery ball and so many reasons or whatever. Maybe the pressure of the occasion, the pressure of the moment got to him or the pass was just shit. 
which is what I would have said. You know, that was a shit pass. And you let it bounce. Should have got it to my hands. Or chipped it ahead for me to go and use my speed and just dive on the bloody thing. But look, it's um, all, you know, in hindsight now. And I think if Fiji moves on from this quickly mentally, then they can focus on their next game and just focus on being one of those top two in the pool, which is what, you know, a lot of us Fijian fans want to see. I, I definitely want to see them make it to the quarters. So, um, you know, they're, they're kind of the darlings of the Pacific at the moment. And I'd love to see the flying Fijians do well. So, um Fair play to Wales. They played hard and they played well. Oh man, the the amount of tackles they did just to keep Fiji, mm -hmm. you know, out. Oh my God, it was like something like two hundred and nine at one point tackles to Fiji's probably a third of that. So fair play and well done to to Wales on uh, the great defence and keeping them out. You know, Fiji definitely looked like they wanted that win, and so did Wales. So yeah, that's that's where I stand on that. Just pulling up that stat now. So Wales made 248 tackles in that game. Right. In contrast, Fiji made 70. So they defended their ass off. But the referee, just coming back to your point earlier, 17 penalties Wales conceded, heaps of them on their own line, and he wouldn't give them a card. And I think Fiji, I can't find it, but I think it was only like five or six that then started pulling the cards out for them. And that's where... People are up in arms saying, you know what, these tier two nations are it's already an uphill battle and then they're getting the referee giving them some favourable decisions. So you bring up the fact that he's Welsh. I don't want to pull that into it, but I know if I was a referee in the all blacks I'd probably get them some calls. <laughs> it's human nature. So you can't really help it but uh Yeah, they could hook me up later on, the All Blacks if they were if I was refereeing them. But Roger mate, have you I'm not sure if you caught much of that game or any of the other games but uh, have you made anything of the refereeing we've seen so far, even with that All Blacks game, some of the, the cards we've seen there? Yeah. I guess with the Fiji-Wales game, I did watch it um, before heading into work. And it was their fifth Rugby World Cup encounter. I don't know what the tally is, but I think Wales have won the majority of them. But with oh. the 2007 upset um, that where Fiji beat Wales at that World Cup, and I think right from the get-go, the the referees, I mean, not the referees, the commentators keep mentioning the discipline of the Fijians in the past, and they kept on mentioning if they if they um, are penalised more than 18, 19 times, then they've got no chance of winning this game. I mean, you just mentioned that it's, it was Wales that had, you know, close to that tally in terms of penalties, yet they win the game. And going back to what Joey mentioned, um, it was it was a hard watch because even towards the back end of that first half, they were getting penalised, and I can't remember exactly where it was. Um, they, were, they had calls go against, and one call was the um, the TMO, the the try that one of the Fijians should have got. It was Ironi Maui's the prop, his try, and so the tier, the referee went upstairs and said he wanted. He said that he, I think he had a try. Can't remember, but they just want some evidence whether it was a try or not. The TMO came back and said that there was no separation, no separation, but there's no press, whatever that means. So there's no separation. Normally, but even the commentator said if there's no separation, that's a try. It should be deemed a try if there's no separation. But the TMO said that. There's no press. I've never heard that before. And I think it surprised the commentators too. And then, so, and, you know, it's, so that was alarming. But then it went on to, I thought Dan Bigger, and as much as he's hard on his players, right, and he was yelling at his players because when Wales try to kick, try to run it from their, their try line at, at the end of the, at the death of that first half, uh, George North got penalised and Dad Bigger was growling him off. <laughs> and I guess they've played over 100 games each for Wales and they've mm. played together and they know each other that well that he can they have that kind of a relationship. But I think going, st staying on the, 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 the officials, there was that in the 60, 65th minute, uh, the yellow card the yellow card was was 
received by Tangi Taki Walu, but there was no warnings. Unlike previously, uh, the, the they in, they continually infringed while they were defending their line, and and yet warning after warning, the referee gave them two lots of warnings. Say the next one will get penalised. Then there was an, an, a number of minutes that went without any penalties, and then they were camped on their line. They got they received another warning after three or four penalties, and then that's when they received their card. But then you'd think, but then after they received the yellow card, every other penalty that happened after that wouldn't that be another yellow card? Because mm. they, they continued to infringe another three or four times after they received a the yellow card. So they've already been warned. It doesn't reset it. They should still then get another yellow card. But right. again, the commentators were. Um, some of the, one of them mentioned it that as well because the continual infringing should deem another yellow card, or are they they got to bank another three infringements before they get another warning? But then on the sixty sixty fifth minute, without warning, um, the Fijian player gets yellow carded, and I remember the commentator saying it must have been because it was more cynical than what the Welsh were doing previously. <laughs> so how do they? You know, how has the referee done that? Because there was no warning and there was no um, sequence of or, or continuation of infringing from the Fijian players. But then they've deemed it that one's more cynical. So your sin is is is, is up here, is murder, compared to his, uh, his theft, his shoplifting mm. sin from the Welsh players. Sorry about the analogy. But, um, mm-hmm. and so I, I would have thought, yeah, with the continuing um, infringements that they should have received another yellow card to then, you know, remind them that they can't continually infringe. But here we are. Yeah. Yeah, it's just so hard because, you know, the Tier 2 nations, they're already up against it, trying to play even an average Welsh team. But with all the resources and all the money and all the players and everything they've got and the professional systems and everything it's an uphill battle already to then get be on the bad side of poor refereeing um mm. you know that makes the, the job even you know a hundred times more harder and i'm with you joey i mean this has the potential to be the best rugby world cup we've ever seen with the competitiveness of all the teams mm. however the refereeing or well, i'd hate to see it overshadowing uh, overshadowed with uh you know some referees having uh, too much influence over the results. So hopefully that can be sorted out. Um, and just one more point, Stace, yeah. is that I know because Dan Bigger is a massive part, right? And he's he's like the quarterback for the Swash team, at, you know, in that game. And so is he is he a bias where he's protected from certain infringing? Because he was a – when they were camped on their line, he, he gave away a penalty. The arm came back out for the referee. But then, because I think the, the the Fijians must have scored or something, that ref, that, then that infringement's no longer, you know, pen, penalizable, if that's a word. But he came through offside, but then he grabbed around the head. He headlocked the halfback or the person closest to the ball, mm-hmm. you know, and and so he's easily, you know, that's it's just sort of like. It's astounding how some players or some countries can get away with that kind of... Because if that was a Pacific Island nation doing a head roll or headlock, mate, there would be definite penalty, maybe even a yellow card. So, and that's why it's 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 sad. You don't want it to come down to that, but you'd think that it could be costly for, you know... And then it goes back to that try, the TMO making a call. There's no press... On the, there's no separation, so the hand is on the ball the whole time, yet there's no press. Oh, and so yeah, these I are the kind of that calls before. that we're up against, you know, tuned here nations. But it just seemed like a lot of the commentary as well was was quite biased and saying that. Um, hold on, I, I wrote it down. Uh, it was something to do with. That it was un it was historically it's unfijian like rugby. 
things words like that you know historically because they were keeping the ball and they went they, they had so many phases they're keeping hold and that's where the the set piece not only the set piece but the forwards you know i guess traditionally it's always been about the backs getting it wide and seeing what the backs can do or the razzle dazzle but you know with their forwards working tirelessly and just you know trucking the ball up phase after phase after phase they were able to do that and so when when they say it's historically it's unfijian like rugby, you know it's just some of the things that and then you know they were on the back foot with saying that traditionally, if they if they clock up eighteen plus penalties in a game, there's no way that Fiji would win this game. So, and I think you know some of those calls helped Wales escape a loss here. I mean we we, we bring up the Rad Radra, I mean that. He didn't have to skip the pass. I don't think he had to skip that. A, a three, when it came to the person that passed it, the, the long pass out to Radradra, he still had two players between him and Radradra. But then that three would have been on two of the Welsh players. So he could have passed it to one more and then they could have skipped one to Radradra. So the pass wouldn't have been as difficult to catch. But it just dropped at Radradra's um, feet. So it made, a, made for a difficult pass to catch. But yeah, could have. They had an awesome comeback, but just couldn't quite get across the line. Yeah, oh, that's it was such a such a disappointing game because we uh, I know we've talked about this before, but uh, you know Fiji is probably the best of the Pacific nations, and that game could turn out to be crucial in the the overall wash up. So that. That was disappointing. But um, we've just that's got where a the two, those two points, those two points that they got from that um, game, is going to prove to be really important because mm. they still got Australia in that. So Australia and Georgia potentially could be where they could, you know, tough games. So those two points that they've been able to get from that loss to Wales could be the difference between who comes second in this pool or who comes first. Mm-hmm. 